So I just want to, uh, first of all, uh, thank the uh, organizers for uh, creating such a wonderful and uh, interesting session. As I was driving late, as usual, to uh, this session, I was listening on NPR to a description of uh, the rivalry between the Canadians, um, Canadian um, hockey team and the Boston Bruins, and, um, and how one of the players said that the very uh, earnest rivalry between those two teams was actually excellent for the sport because it made everybody pay more attention to it. And so in that spirit, to both keep you awake at this last talk and to make a pedagog pedagogical point, I'm going to say that the first talk that you heard and the first half of the second talk that you heard are pointing us in exactly the wrong direction. And that our, bril and our, that our brilliant two colleagues who have done beautiful work are actually pointing us to the wrong place. And that I'd like you to consider some alternatives. <laughs> so some questions I'd like us to consider. Is there a qualitatively new threat to, pregn uh, to pregnancy, to privacy? <laughs> the, 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 the who's your daddy uh, thing. <laughs> Okay, how does that um, threat inform our expectation for privacy? Is any expectation of privacy reasonable? You might conclude, based on the things that we, the talks we just heard, that it's not. How best to provide, pr preserve privacy, autonomy, and accelerate medical progress? And let's review what's at stake. I think it's very important to internalize this. Those of us who have been involved in genomics for a while tend to look at the, at the genome, but look what the real landscape of big data is. We have structured data. We have unstructured data. We have clinical systems data. We have judiciary data. We have quantified life data. We have the social uh, web. If you're a computer scientist, as I am, I have a PhD in computer science, and I'm trained as a pediatric endocrinologist. This is gravy, because all of this is data about you. And if you look at it, I have two arrows. On the vertical arrow is linking different types of data across the individual, and data on the horizontal axis allows you to fill in missing data. But if you're a computer scientist, the question you're asking yourself is probabilistically, how can I identify characteristics of the individual or identify the individual or characteristics of a subpopulation like that individual based on all these? And the more data you have in, that, in this big rectangle of big data, the better you can do. And it's not, and frankly, DNA is the smallest part of all these data. And there are myriad business plans that are around taking advantage of this. And so the talks you just heard are reproduced in every one of these sub, and take any sub rectangle of that rectangle. And the talks you just heard in the first two talks are reproduced again and again in any of the sub, those sub rectangles from tweeting to police records. So what's the concern? Well, we just heard a fantastic piece of work done by Yaniv's group about, and it was very, very well reported upon, about how they were um, able to re-identify um, patients in the 100,000 genomes cohort. Truly, a, uh, I think, a masterful piece of work. But as a computer scientist, I have to say, and I was both impressed and I was depressed because you know what happened after this was published? Several data sets got removed, public data sets got removed from the web. And it reminded me of a, uh, there was a paper by David Craig in PLOS Genetics, I think, and after he published his paper showing how looking at SNP studies in public uh, databases, Lots of NIH databases got closed down to the public 
and the amount of effort and IRB work I had to do to get to those data sets went up by an order of magnitude. Also, I, I said to myself, Yaniv, this is not news. Another computer scientist, a colleague of mine from MIT, now at Harvard, back in um, the 90s, when William Weld, our former governor, vomited publicly right after a speech. I guess it was not a very good speech. Um, she was able to take very basic demographic data from him, his age, where he lived, and looking at the public insurance records of all public personnel, was able to completely re-identify him, find his whole medical record. And the computer science tricks, you know, there are people who are just as smart as we are and don't actually advertise it because they're too busy doing stuff. So there's a company called LexisNexis. Part of their business is just accumulating all that rectangle that I just showed you before. And they do many, many things. But let me show you one cool thing that they've done way before any of us started thinking about these things. If you see a child who's missing, missing for years, and you want to reunite them with their parent. Can you imagine how, you, how would you go about reuniting hundreds of kids who, as babies or toddlers or five-year-olds, were taken from their families 10, 15 years ago? Well, I know some people who actually succeeded in doing it. What did they do? They went through all the United States and find out, looked at all the individuals getting a new driving license. And they asked, who's living with you? You 18-year-old or 17-year-old who just got a driving license. And, by the way, that person who you're living with, did he ever live near any of the places that these children were missing from? Sounds pretty loosey-goosey, right? Then, using the big data that I just showed you, they are able to figure out which of those registrations are fake. In other words, that individual was not born with that name. And they're able, they were able to identify dozens of children who had been gone for decades just by pulling together this database playing that probabilistic game that all computer scientists understand across that big rectangle. And so Joe Pritchard, if you want to hear, talk to him about what they're doing at LexisNexis, do this all the time. This is not, this is a well-known game. Lots of loose probabilistic linkages with lots and lots of data allow you to very precisely triangulate individuals. This has led to some statements from Eric Schmidt, for example. If you have something to, that you don't want anybody to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. What a well, thank you, uh, St. Schmidt. Um, <laughs> except he then blackballed uh, CNET reporters when they started reporting on aspects of his private life that they discovered using, ironically, Google. Um, also, some uh, enviably young and bright hipsters, such as this guy, uh, said uh, privacy is dead and social media hold uh, uh, the smoking gun. And if you look down on the left, he says, oh, it's terrible that social media um, um, take away our privacy. But if you really want to be effective, make sure you tweet and maximize your, uh, your um, public uh, persona. So my perspective is, it's one thing to say, I sh you know, it's, if I'm in a room talking to a colleague and some spooks are bouncing um, uh, infrared uh, lasers off my window to, uh, see, to measure the sound waves, I probably should be very annoyed if they um, 
that they're doing that. It seems like that's bad behavior. I think we could all recognize that as bad behavior. Um, it says the folks uh, next door are arguing whether or not eavesdropping is right or wrong. But, and then, but there's a, these, it's a, a bigger societal question. This individual who's overhearing some uh, conversations, is that wrong or is that right? I mean, it's in the public domain after all. Should there be any expectation of public data being private? I mean, that was a private conversation, but he was right next door. What expectations should there be? Some who are very, very public, have incredibly public uh, pro pro uh, profiles, like Scarlett Johansson, has said how uh, hurtful and wrong she thought it was, be was that even though she's a public actress, a lot of private details were scooped up in the te using the techniques we just heard about to actually um, reveal things that she had never intended to share and everybody on, on Facebook would know that they, she did not want them to share. What do patients think? This is a study that appeared in JAMA Internal Medicine last year, and I think it's an incredibly useful study because what it shows is that, so the negative bars, the deeper the bar goes down, the more patients are worried. And the study shows that, um, first of all, it shows that people are less worried about sharing of data for research. They're more worried about it for quality and uh, studies, and most worried about it for marketing. But ironically, all the barriers are for research. For quality, you don't even need a quality study in the hospital. You don't even need IRB uh, review. And what I didn't show here, and it was a puzzling but a, a, a fact, is that um, public health was actually also uh, worrisome, public health research as opposed to basic biomedical uh, or medical research. And what's also worth showing here is the ordering, but not the absolute magnitude, of these concerns are shared across multiple ethnicities. And this shows what our institutions look like. And so these patients are, turns out, are fairly confident in that their information is protected by physician offices, not by genetic testing companies, by the American Cancer Society, they have a great deal of confidence, by the National Institutes of Health, not much confidence in Google or Facebook. So people understand these things. But what they're saying is, I want my data to be shared for research, but I don't want it to be shared for Google and Facebook. Is that a reasonable perspective? Because in fact, all the barriers are in just the opposite uh, direction. You don't have an IRB uh, review for public health research, for um, quality research, but you do have for biomedical research. And of course, it's ironic because in just the way I described, and I want to point to you an old but still important Institute of Medicine report called For the Record, Protecting Electronic Information, where they make the point that most people that we worry about actually have completely unfettered access to our data. So is genomic data different from other health data? It's not the biggest. The MRI that you're also paying actually now twice as much as for a genome, your $2,000 MRI, it has much more uh, data in it than a genome. It's not the most predictive. If you're healthy, a uh, very nice study came out of Hopkins shows that given the fact that most common diseases have heritability of around 50%, it's not very predictive. It's not the most expensive anymore. You can now find many more expensive medical tests. It's not the uh, most identifying of that risks uh, subgroups. It still is up 23 or me notwithstanding. If you tell me that I'm overweight, I'm a smoker, and I have a family history of cardiac disease, I know a lot more about your, uh, your general health risk than a genome screen today, on average. But it is the most identity disclosing. It is a fingerprint of you. So what's the right protection? <laughs> this is the non-artistic version of what we heard about today. We have a per we saw in vivid video someone on a, on a um, subway take a random genomic picture of an individual. And I actually believe our first speaker, because I think she's right. 
that in the future we'll be able to get better and better pictures. So it's like taking a picture of someone on the subway. Here in Massachusetts, we had a recent experience of this. Um, a um, individual was indicted because, and found guilty, because he had taken an upskirt shot. But then what happened is the Supreme Judicial, Judicial uh, Court of Massachusetts ruled that a man taking cellular phone enabled photographs of a skirt did not violate a peeping Tom a criminal law that prohib prohibited photographs of nude and partially uh, uh, nude women in, in, in locations where they had reasonable expectations. So this was said to be legal. <laughs> People got really upset. Really upset. And I like, this is my, uh, that was my favorite comment. Call me weird, but I think a person should be able to have a reasonable expectation of privacy underneath their own clothes. <laughs> now, now what, one, way to, one way to take our first two uh, lectures today is to say, no, that's not a reasonable expectation. But you know, I don't think the general public would have been impressed by these, um, those arguments. So, because what was the response? What was the response, let's take cell phones and make those lethal weapons under full control, triple locked, with a um, court order to release the phones? Do we put a lock and key on each phone? Do we um, disable phones? Are these phones dangerous technology? They're identified, do we change the phones? Did anybody suggest that? No. Did anybody suggest we have to wear suits <laughs> that don't allow any upskirt shooting? Did we hear that? And because of this morning's talk, I thought of a third thing that we didn't hear. We didn't hear that we should create invisible powers <laughs> so that we stay invisible. That's, the, in my opinion, the wrong societal response. What was the right societal response? Within two days, there was a legislative ruling that said, we can recognize that this is bad, it's bad, it's illegal. Two days. And everybody said, there was no academic discussion about this. There's no, oh, what should we do to protect cell phones? Should we make ourselves invisible, uh, new clothes? No, it's not right, and we know it. Come on, guys, ladies. We know what's right or wrong. It's an easy smell test. And we can just say, if you do it, that's, that's wrong. So static was revised. So what did we learn from this? We learned, I'm gonna read it since it's a little bit small, the legislature did its job originally with a focused statute addressing the problem it, it saw. Principle, when should prohibit carefully, the court did its job. Principle, when a person will face two and one and a half years in jail for doing something, courts rightly compel government to warn them clearly without ambiguity, so we have to warn people. So the legislature did its job again. Principle, distinguish good and bad acts and prohibit the use of bad uses of technology, not the good ones. An engaged public living in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and there's a profound meaning to that word, the Commonwealth, expressed definitively that the people want everyone's privacy protected, not just my own. And they can distinguish bad acts and actors from overreactions. And the protection is in the form of prohibiting peeping toms, not, for example, banning all forms of men possessing all cell phones on the subway, which is exactly what was happening in reaction to um, these early, uh, earlier um, descriptions of disclosures. I want to thank my colleague, uh, the attorney, uh, pa Patrick Taylor. He's one of our faculty at the Harvard Law uh, School uh, Petrie Flom Center. So can we be as wise as the citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts without calling up the legislature for each medical privacy concern? Back in 2005, with my colleague Russ Altman, I asked a question in a New England Journal article that entitled Health Information Altruists, a Potentially Critical Resource. And Russ and I noted that uh, there was cause for concern. There's no perfect anonymity. As computer scientists, we both realized there's no technical thing that will ever guarantee. The more you guarantee genuine 
anonymity, the less useful the data is. You take away utility and you create barriers, the more you're effectively anonymous. And we also recognize uh, that there's effects that are good and bad of these data. And we add that there's a double-edged sword for sharing data. But also, very importantly, different people have different levels of concern about sharing of this data. And we, we had the solution where we basically said, we need to create mechanisms that allow us to um, agree to share altruistically our data at various levels of disclosure. And different people are going to be different, uh, comfortable at different levels. Furthermore, we have to protect researchers from being liable in ways that the health marketeers are not liable today. And most importantly, to emphasize not so much privacy, but autonomy. Patients should have the ability to fully control who sees what and when. That's not a technological argument, because as a computer scientist, I can assure you, and as a genomicist, whatever thing you will do, you're just creating a good red flag for one of my students to overcome it. So here's an altruist for you, this weirdo. Um, made his whole genome um, available through nature in 2008. That's, of course, James Watson. And so if you're an information altruist, you put it all out in the public. And you can, in fact, find people who are willing to put it all out in public, like George Church's uh, PGP-10. By the way, they should sue him for these pictures. Like, they all look like criminals. <laughs> um, and, um, but they put all their clinical genomic data out there. And they were fully informed. God bless them. There are some with, whose beard is even better than George Church's, <laughs> RMS, Richard Stallman, who says, eh, I'm not going to go that direction. Just take more and more data out of the public uh, wheel because you can't trust them. Well, that's a problem because it's going to get in the way of the studies that I'm talking about. Or most people don't care or don't care enough. I'm one of them. I use a, a service called Mint.com. I give it every single password I have to every financial resource I have, and it aggregates every day and tells me uh, how much in debt I am and who's going to call me with an overdue bill. <laughs> very, it's very useful, and I've given it all, because I trust them. Perhaps foolishly, but day to day, they're giving me utility, and I'm trading. But I'm trading explicitly. They let me know. This led me to a science article that I wrote in 2007 where I said, let's stop being so damn paternalistic. Let's stop telling patients we, can't, uh, we, ha we have to make you anonymous and we can't recontact you if we have uh, research results. Instead, I said, let's create informed cohorts where, and I don't have time today to tell you about it, you can read the paper, where I propose that every time there's an interesting finding, if you had a setting on your web browser or personal health record. You could get results that pertain to you for everything, for class of findings, minus the class of findings, everything except psychiatric, everything against cancer. And this is now doable. And we're beginning to see business plans formed around, not mine, business plans formed around this idea. I think this is where we are going, giving patients true autonomy and saying, you control it, and contractually protecting them so they can sue you if you do one of these re-identifying ex exploits. This is America. Lawsuits really work in enforcing certain kinds of behavior. So what's at stake? Privacy is at stake. There's no doubt about it. And we care a lot about privacy. Autonomy is at stake. And we care a lot about autonomy. Personal, but personal and public health, perhaps, is at stake. And I want to emphasize this. I was privileged to, part, to take part of a Institute of Medicine report called Precision Medicine, where we were very inspired by Google's ability to take a coordinate system of X and Y, longitude and longitude, and, la and, la and layer multiple types of data on top of longitude and latitude, and creating a whole value economy all the way from where the restaurants are to how to get to my friend's house to where to avoid the police speed trap. And we said, can we create that same value in healthcare, we 
we talked about an health information commons, where we layered all the data, but instead of the coordinates being longitude and latitude, they're the individual. And we're gonna layer all that data. And we made up the point that what I've just outlined in, in uh, green, the observational data from the healthcare system is the perhaps now the most valuable part. But it's the least accessible for a variety of reasons, not least of which is the excuse that some of these studies give, that I just heard, to not share them. Because people worry about privacy. But in fact, the real underlying motive is these institutions don't want to share. And so, if we actually pay too close attention to the wrong message of the prior studies, what's going to happen is the roadmap that the NIH, and specifically the NIH National Human Genome Research Institute, have said is our future for translation medicine. If we start making it too difficult to join the clinical outcome to the um, genomics and the environmental exposures, the roadmap is going to be fractured. Let me give you quickly some studies. I founded something called I2B2, Informatics for Integrating Biology in the Bedside. It basically says, how can we turn our healthcare systems into living laboratories? And I'll give you a quick few pastiches that give you a sense of what you can do when you can actually nimbly bring these data together, which if everybody becomes invisible, you will not be able to do. So this is one individual bouncing around the system multiple times. They come in the, in the healthcare system in the center, and as you get closer to the present, you reach the circumference. All the diagnosis codes have been lumped into these categories. Anybody want to imagine what that diagnosis is? Football player. I like it. Most medical audiences are very cynical and they say uh, Munchausen's, uh, malingering. malingering. Uh, but actually, this is domestic abuse. And um, we were able to take all the data from all of Massachusetts, every single emergency department, and we were able to predict using a simple naive Bayes predictor. Domestic abuse two years on average before the healthcare system was aware of it, and up to six years. Because we had all the data from all these patients who had agreed to have their data shared for research by virtue of becoming patients. Think of what, and these are not subtle genomic odds, like odds ratios of 1.8 that you like to brag about. These are odds ratios of 100, really actionable. Here's something else. You see that mountain? That mountain happened between 2001 and 2004. You'd be cheering me if I was telling you about I had reduced um, uh, heart attacks by 5% in Massachusetts. But in fact, in these two great hospitals in Massachusetts, what is this? It's an 18% increase in heart attacks. Observation number one, until we looked at it, no one knew it had happened to us. 18% increase in heart attacks by bringing all the data together. Worse, what was this? Viox in, Viox off. And you look at case control, it was Viox. We were actually doing this to our patients. We were actually doing it to those patients. Qu quick other study using I2B2, genomic studies. We were able to do genomic studies using discarded samples and the clinical data phenotyped through natural language processing in a tenth of the time, tenth of the percent of cost. And unlike all the other genomic studies, we get to study, guess who? African Americans and Hispanics, who are totally underrepresented in these studies, because they are part of the healthcare system. And they have agreed to allow their data to be used for research within the healthcare system, because the healthcare system is trusted. Another study by my colleagues showed the seasonal patterns across Massachusetts of coughing. Basic insight kids cough, adults cough two, two weeks later, adults die two weeks later after that. In a nutshell, the three-year-olds go to meet each other in that middle-class cesspool known as daycare. The viruses recombine. They go home. They kill granddad. <laughs> a a true. After we published this, the uh, vaccination age went from five to three. Real public health impact by combining data of our patients. Immediate public health impact. We took. I2B2 and create a distributed query system across all our Harvard hospitals. And a group of investigators, unrelated to me, used that 
six million patient database to identify a, to take a disease that's lethal to women in the third trimester, extremely rare. They were looking at angiogenic imbalance and they found only a handful at Beth Israel. But using this shrine system, the Shared Health Research Informatics Network, they were able to find four dozen of those patients and actually confirm they're finding enough to get published in Nature. Finally, we had patients who are willing to make their data public and share them for competitions. And so this individual, that kid, got this birthday cake 11 years after he was born. He had a diagnosis of central nuclear myopathy. And it's only because we were able to share his data under legal protection that 30 teams could actually share them. They could have done evil hacking things, but everybody would know it was, it was wrong. And they held to what they were supposed to do, which is identify the, the genetic variant, which was identified in three months, which the same hospitals which had cared for him had not been able to do for years. So I want to just say in closing, let's think about what is the right response. And I'm looking forward to any discussion if we have any. Thank you very much.